Captain John Smith and other Englishmen arrived on the coast of America, he noticed a picturesque place where he decided to unload his 108 passengers. There he established the first permanent British settlement in America. They chose Jamestown Island. Early in the morning of May 14, 1607, they took into their possession the promised land, America. We might never have learned about the existence of Poles in Jamestown if it hadn't been for very well-known Milwaukee priest, Father Václav Kruszka, on his uh, very monumental work on the history of the Poles, came across a book on glass blowing. He discovered that Poles were mentioned as blowing glass in Jamestown. And that became the start of the investigation of, oh, the Poles are in, in Jamestown that early, what were they doing there, how did they get there, what else are they doing there, what contributions did they make. Discovery of the New World, uh, North and South America and the Caribbean, uh, beginning with Columbus, opened up this whole area for uh, investment. It brought tremendous amount of wealth to Europe. The Spanish had colonized South America and Spain almost overnight in historical terms had gone from being a second or third rate power in Europe to being the superpower of Europe of the day. The Spanish did have expeditions into the Carolinas uh, during this period uh, to, uh, to search for um, their own uh, sources of wealth but also to, uh, to be on the lookout for any Englishmen. The French, the English, the Dutch, other countries all wanted to try and establish colonies in North America to share this wealth. Poles were to be aware of the judgment of God as well as their own conscience. Plundering around the world had to be unthinkable. In England, a rowdy traveler, Sir Walter Raleigh, organized expeditions in search of the Golden Fleece. They hoped to find uh, wealth, uh, gold, silver perhaps, uh, perhaps a route to Asia. Uh, the geography of North America was very poorly understood in, in Europe at that time. So there was some hope that they could find a quick route to China, to, to India still. They thought that the Orient was not that far away. Well, they didn't realize that the whole North American continent was there, so this was a mistake. In 1584, a flotilla of seven ships with 108 men reached the Roanoke Island. Unfortunately, the settlement established by them collapsed. Two years later, there was another attempt, also unsuccessful. Those people disappeared and we never found out later on whatever happened to them. The Roanoke colony had failed, uh, and, and this had perhaps would have discouraged uh, settlement further south. Uh, perhaps the Spanish threat had been part of that. The company organized a third expedition, whose purpose was to gain a foothold in North America. On the 14th of May, 1607, 104 Englishmen reached the River James in Virginia. Here on the island, they established what is today a historical settlement, Jamestown. Jamestown was really the first significant British outpost in the New World. It was the first one that lasted. The impetus for establishing colonies was clearly very economic from the standpoint of the English government and the people who invested in the Virginia Company of London. They were always trying to cater to the well wishes of the king. Of course, Jamestown is named after King James of England. The James River is named after the King of England, King of England and Scotland, uh, James I. And even the founding of Jamestown 
uh, coming as it did amid global conf conflicts between the English and the Spanish on one hand, later the English and the French, and then the English allied against the French and Spanish together. The British were competing with Spain, and they were seeking uh, wealth, obviously. There was a measure of competition, and the colony was ultimately established by a group of investors. The colony of Jamestown and the eventually the English colonies in North America uh, was, it was an important aspect of this global war fought between largely England against the French and Spanish allied against England for control of a worldwide empire and the economic riches that that would result in. Since then, the Poles learned to be content with what they had, not coveting anything others possessed. Always they sat far away from the world's bowl of treasures. The position of Jamestown is quite interesting because uh, the Spanish by this time were shipping large amounts of gold and silver across and it was very lucrative to raid those ships. So it's quite possible that the English also wanted to get in on the Spanish wealth. The Jamestown colony was really a beginning experiment and it was an experiment in a land that was relatively hostile. Jamestown Colony, of course, was uh, situated right in the near the lands that were held by a very large Indian nation, and their chief was Powhatan, and uh, something like eight or 9,000 Indians lived in that area. The climate was hot and humid. The waterways and the swamps in the area around Jamestown where they settled had a lot of mosquitoes and diseases. There was not a ready support source of uh, food there. It was very difficult for the original settlers, however, to establish the county. There were a number of them who did not really have any skills. The first year at Jamestown was extremely difficult. The, the Jamestown settlement itself was positioned partly to defend itself against potential Spanish raid. It was not necessarily placed in a good location uh, for either agriculture or fishing. There was additional problem in that the, there was a conflict with the local native community, uh, the Powhatan Confederacy. And the interesting story, I think, about uh, the Indians is that they really, under their chief, did not try to destroy the colony. The, the belief is that this chief thought that uh, the, the, these colonists would die off from the poisoned water and the lack of food and the bad uh, temperature. Well, this was a very risky venture, something that uh, uh, people were really quite literally ris risking their lives to do. And anyone who came to this infant colony was literally taking their life in their hands and venturing into something which was largely unknown at that time. One of the main threats to the Jamestown colony was the Spanish showing up and burning the place to the ground. Englishmen perceived Spaniards as the primary threat. There was not a single moment in the history of Jamestown when they weren't afraid of an attack by the Spanish Armada. So they would have employed all the weapons in their arsenal to see what was going on, both intelligence, they certainly would have tried to find out as much as possible about the colony, what the colonists were doing there, uh, but also perhaps militarily. The leader, John Smith, was a very capable leader. Many of the individuals who originally came were not necessarily people who were adept at surviving off the land. They had assumed they would find perhaps some advanced Indian civilization, much as the Spanish had found. Englishmen, as well as Spaniards, expected easy trophies, mainly gold and silver. Unfortunately, Native Americans from North America didn't have any gold. When they arrived, they found none of this, and it was a great difficulty. The English were really not very well prepared. Some of them were uh, noblemen, gentlemen, as they say, who were spending most of their time uh, drinking and uh, playing. Most of them were soldiers or adventurers, and not necessarily farmers or fishermen. They didn't really work very hard. They didn't know how to dig a well. They weren't prepared to do any work, so <laughs> this was a uh, pretty big of a disaster. The first year of the Jamestown colony, quite a few of the settlers died, uh, and in the second year as well, from famine and from disease, uh, we're told that within the first 18 months or so, uh, over half of the entire initial contingent of colonists had died. Smith had 
uh, participated uh, in travels throughout Eastern Europe, had met Poles, I was familiar with certainly Polish artisans and the economies of the area. As a very young fellow, maybe a teenager, he went off to fight he was a soldier. He hired on to be a mercenary uh, in the uh, army of Austria. He was uh, fought very well against the Turks, against the Ottoman Turks. He was actually captured, enslaved. He escaped, and he got back to England through Poland. Poles knew very well what Turkish captivity meant. Therefore, they helped him return to England. It's likely at that time uh, that he encountered some Polish officers. Uh, they were also serving with the Austrians. And that's where he met many different Polish people, and he realized they had many skills. Surprisingly, England and Poland at that time were closely connected, with as many as 30,000 English, Scottish, and Irish living and working in Poland, and about 1,000 Poles living in London. There was also a large contingent of Polish merchants who did business with England and actually lived in London, uh, many of them along a place called Poland Street. So the English were well aware of what was available in Poland. Poland in 1608 was quite a different country. It was a vast country. It included not only present-day Poland, but it also included much of the Ukraine, much of Belarus, the Baltic states. It was a vast country of about 400,000 square miles. And in fact, the king of Poland at that time was looking to become even Tsar of Russia. That's how powerful and how significant Poland was at that time. In the 1570s, Queen Elizabeth I had granted a monopoly to the British Eastland Company to establish a trading post in Elblong. And this was initially the main British outpost in Poland where they traded for grain and also forest products. Later on, Gdańsk became a very significant factor. So uh, these trade ties had been a very long standing between Poland and Britain. When it seemed that Jamestown would share the fate of the previous colonies, a wise decision of Captain John Smith, his appeal to the king, consent was issued to bring foreigners to the colony. Suddenly, we heard surprising news that some of us would be asked to go to foreign and distant lands, uninhabited but rich. On October 1st, 1608, five Polish settlers arrived in Jamestown aboard the Mary and Margaret. There were two Polish noblemen, Michał Lewicki and Jan Bogdan, as well as artisans, Zbigniew Stefanski, Stanisław Sadowski, and Jan Marta. Zbigniew Stefanski wrote about this historic moment. After a long journey and extreme suffering, we saw birds, and soon after, we saw the land. I fell on my knees, offering prayers to Almighty God. Michał Wawitski, of noble birth, was named the leader of our group's expedition to Virginia. Jormata, who was also called Jan, was to take charge of making of soap. Stanisław Sadowski, having experience as a house builder, was to be in charge of lumber production. Jan Bogdan, he accomplished everything with ease, finding solutions to every kind of problem. Both of us were Christ's age, an age when a person is most apt to undertake the greatest risks and furthermore is the most suited for world travel. By the time the second uh, ship came, this was in October of 1608, with the first Poles that came to America, a Jamestown colony was practically on its last legs. The hungry and desperate settlers looted all they could. Pigs, dogs and horses, even rats and water snakes. Also, leather shoes became food. 
the, the poles were brought over to, uh, to create products that the British needed, but also to create potentially products that the, uh, that the Indians would want. Uh, that then could be traded for food. And of course, uh, the, there was the possibility of creating some local industries. Despite its good strategic location, Jamestown was not an ideal spot for a colony with its swampy, mosquito-infested terrain. Clear water was scarce. The settlers suffered from infections, fever, and dysentery caused by drinking water from the river. Polish settler Zbigniew Stefanski recorded this impression of Jamestown. Seldom had one seen such lack of resourcefulness as we found in Virginia. Not even a spoonful of drinking water was to be found in the fort. The people here marveled when we dug a well and presented it to them. The Poles uh, helped build uh, uh, or dig a well that finally got the colony some good water, drinking water. Pitch uh, was very important. Uh, it was essentially the universal glue of the time. All the ships, all the boats, the, the houses, everything that was made would have, would have required this. This was essential. After their arrival, the Poles built a glass furnace, which became the first American factory. The main problem that the British had is that the, they had nothing that the Indians wanted. Zbigniew Stefanski wrote, under my personal supervision, several furnaces were built for the production of glass, for which practically naked Virginian female savages brought us grain and fish in their baskets, picking up every chip of glass from the ground to decorate their strange attire. For the Indians, a lot of this was the, the purposes of a political alliance, and the English would have realized this early on by giving the Indians things that they wanted, glass, for example, or metal products. The English are, in a sense, securing a form of alliance with the Indians. Uh, so beyond the economic uh, value of any of these goods, uh, there was a very important security aspect. Glass products became the first American products exported to Europe. We have to realize that there's a great distance between England and, uh, and Jamestown, and to ship uh, supplies over was very costly. It was much cheaper to get supplies from the local Indians, which meant, of course, that either they had to militarily defeat the Indians, which they couldn't do in the early years, or they had to ha have things that they could trade. This was one of the major reasons for importing foreign crafts and poles, of course. In 1608, Captain John Smith became president, and his leadership kept the colony from dissolving. He enforced strict discipline. Those who would not work should not eat, he declared. We plowed the fields eagerly and sowed the grain that was not eaten by the rats. Yet everyone in the colony had to look after his food as best he could in order to stay alive. Captain John Smith, the president of the Jamestown colony, deeply respected the Poles, not only for their excellent craftsmanship, but also for their bravery, and he regarded them as indispensable to the survival of their new colony. England at the time had the largest merchant marine in the world, the largest navy. They needed uh, potash and soap ash and hemp and rosin in the process of making ships and making them waterproof. They needed the tall pines or ship masts. So all of these commodities that John Smith talked about importing the Poles and Dutchmen to make were things that were designed eventually, once they took hold, to make a profit for the shareholders back in England. So one of the options they had was to make bricks of glass that they could then send back to England to be molded into different shapes. The colony continued to ship things back to England to show that in fact there was something worthwhile that was being done in Jamestown. The second group of colonists under John Smith uh, were very important because they saved the colony. If the British were going to get anywhere, there were certain products they needed, and, and wood products would be one of them. Any of the ships that would come across the Atlantic would need to be repaired at Jamestown, otherwise they wouldn't get home. Any fishing boats that they might have had. Certainly things like pitch or any of, the, any of the products I mentioned, potash, any of their houses would have used pitch. All these things were essential.
These people really did have skills. Uh, they had skills in glass making. They had uh, skills uh, in building things. They knew how to put together a building. They, had, they were carpenters. Smith was very favorable toward the Poles. Uh, he saw them as a very valuable asset to the community and he treated them in this way. Soon the Dutch, whom we brought with us, became a menace to the Virginia settlement. Their perversity reached such a degree that they were persuading the savages to attack Smith. He thought of Poles as one of his major assets, unlike some of the Germans who later on uh, left the Jamestown colony and joined up with the local Indians. Three of the Dutchmen, or Germans as some people call them, were sent by Smith to the Indian camp to help, help them erect houses and so forth, uh, and that some of them apparently conspired with the Indians against the English. Smith had a much lower opinion of the Germans vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Poles. He considered the Poles very trustworthy uh, and certainly was desirous of having as many there as he could get. To stop disorder caused by unruly thieves and the Indians, the Poles built a stronger blockhouse on the neck of the Isle. Before long, new ships arrived, bringing more of our countrymen. Our work now moved at a faster pace. Their arrival made possible for us to rest a little more. Sadovsky, Mata, Stoitsa, and Zrenitsa initiated a ball game played with a bat. Smith uh, was near a stream uh, and was attacked by, uh, by a local Indian warrior from the Powhatan tribe. Smith was in great danger. He was apparently losing the fight, and he, uh, there was a number of poles happened upon the scene or happened to be nearby. We heard Smith's desperate cry, Polonians, Polonians. Realizing that our captain was in great danger, Bogdan and I picked up our daggers, and we ran as fast as we could toward the river. But from some distance, we could see that there was only one attacker, a huge man, the tribal chief himself. Smith ordered us to kill him, but we refused. We don't agree with killing a disarmed prisoner of war, especially when he has tears in his eyes and is begging for mercy. It was highly probable that Smith's adventure in Virginia could have ended there, upon the River James. And this is interesting because, you know, a lot of the uh, stories about Jamestown deal with how Pocahontas, this little Indian girl, saved John Smith's life. But according to the records that these various historians have presented, the Indians, one of the Indian at least, was stopped from killing John Smith by these two poles. Smith was uh, writing his memoirs many years later uh, as a much older man, uh, and he included this story about Pocahontas uh, allegedly saving him, falling in love with him in a sense. This is a theme in Smith's life. Earlier in his memoirs, he relates a very similar story when he's caught in Turkey, allegedly about to be done in, but this beautiful Turkish maiden throws herself on Smith and saves him. Again, this reflects the Pocahontas story very, very closely. We know that he embellished this. We know that Pocahontas was much too young. She was perhaps 12 years old at the time. Uh, she never had any romantic interest with Smith, uh, but she married, of course, another individual John Rolfe. Very important consequences came from that marriage, but uh, it was something that Smith embellished uh, in his memoirs. Uh, this was a, he was writing for a popular audience. Edward Arbor noted in 1884, if Smith had died earlier than he did, the James River settlement must have succumbed. Initially, the Indians were obviously somewhat curious about who these, who these Europeans were there. Early on, a conflicts began to emerge. Chief Pohatan at first expected settlers to die from starvation. However, if this didn't happen, he was ready to slaughter them. Once the relationship with the local natives, the Indians, deteriorated, it was difficult for them to go very far beyond the boundaries of the settlement. And we know that Matthew was killed in a subsequent Indian attack.
the poles are there at the birth of this new world economy that's being created, this new political um, and social, uh, cultural exchange that's going on in the Atlantic. The poles are uh, really there, present at the birth, the midwives, if you want to say, of uh, this new age that's, that's becoming. Whatever happened, it led to the exchange of angry words amongst our captains, resulting in serious quarrels. No one foresaw anything as vile as was perpetrated next by Smith's enemies. Someone set fire to the gunpowder in Smith's boat. Captain Smith's tough but effective rule suddenly came to an end. In October 1609, Smith was injured by a gunpowder explosion and sailed back to England. Zbigniew Stefanski wrote, We Poles immediately called a meeting and agreed that it is also time for us to return. We left Virginia with Smith. Last summer, we found only misery. Now we are leaving with nearly 500 souls, among them about 100 soldiers. There were rifles, swords, halberds, enough of everything for self-defense. 60 buildings. There certainly is ample evidence that Poles remained in the Virginia colony after Smith's departure. We see them uh, referred to now and again in the court records and in the records of the Virginia Company of London. After his departure, only 60 of the original settlers survived the 1609 starving time winter. One of the problems the English uh, colonists, well, all of the colonists ran into was food. They went through a particularly difficult winter during which over half of the colonists perished. After the starving time and the deaths of so many of the colonists, uh, the English were uh, questioning whether they should even continue the Jamestown experiment or not. Bogdan and I decided to go to the Netherlands where at the time we served as helpers in the shipbuilding yards. I must note that Bogdan and I were very fortunate. Soon we were married. Our wives, Berta and Anna, were decent, industrious, efficient, made us feel that they were selected for us by God himself. When John Smith went back to England, both he and the directors of the Virginia Company were interested in recruiting more Poles to come to Jamestown uh, because the initial ones had proved uh, apparently very effective. Because of the high praises Smith was spreading around about us, we were being persuaded to return to Virginia immediately. In fact, we were coerced into it. The British sent more supplies over, they sent more ships over, uh, and, and obviously the uh, sending of the Poles and the other foreigners uh, to, uh, to remedy some of the lack of skills. When our wives heard the accounts of our overseas adventures, both of them expressed the desire to travel to Virginia. Lord de la Ware greeted us sincerely and expressed joy that our wives would join us in this adventure. Lord Delaware, who was one of the stockholders, arrived with additional colonists and supplies and pumped new life, both figuratively and literally. The chief medical officer in the colony was Lawrence Bohan, whose ancestors came from Białystok. As more colonists began to settle, they expanded beyond the original land. They had fights with the Indians, were able to take over property that they used for farming, and one of the big crops uh, that developed was tobacco. Tobacco had been known to the, to the Native Americans for quite some time. It wasn't smoke, it was a recreation, it was ceremonial. So you have uh, farms being established and the Indians eventually 
being forced off. Ultimately, John Rolfe's introduction of tobacco that made the difference. English discover this. Which was then introduced into uh, Europe and it became an important crop. The sugar being the, the most lucrative. Indigo for dyeing clothes. A lot of these uh, sin products of sugar, which is also made into rum uh, and, and, and other, other alcoholic beverages, chocolate. All these products in the New World become immensely popular and there's many Europeans uh, back in London and Krakow and Paris who have the money to afford these. They become very popular. Poles kept arriving in the following years. Among them were members of the Polish gentry, who besides being of the intellectual class, were well acquainted with the methods of production needed at the time in Jamestown. Initially, the, the status was they were simply uh, apparently hired craftsmen, and it, it's not clear that they were accorded the same rights as the Englishmen. They were not given the same political rights. We have to remember that many of these Poles came from the, the Commonwealth in which they were, the significant political rights were being granted. That Poland was a country where Catholics and Protestants coexisted peacefully, as well as many other religious groups, which was not the case in England, not the case in Spain or France. The arrival of these craftsmen uh, and their ability to cross borders very easily uh, says something very important about the, the, the tolerance and freedom that occurred in Poland at the time. In 1619, the colonists organized elections to a body of legislators called the House of Burgesses. Now this election was interesting because the local leaders there, the English, decided not to allow the Poles to be able to vote for their representatives. The Englishmen, well known for their untruthfulness, gave us false assurances and enacted deceitful ordinances which deliberately humiliated the Poles. The Poles had stopped work in protest against the violation of their rights, uh, that they were not being given uh, the rights that they felt that they deserved. And we have to remember that Poland at this time enjoyed a level of personal freedom. The Poles would have certainly felt this very keenly. Apparently what happened was the Poles protested uh, an English law which allowed only citizens of Great Britain to vote and hold office. Our contributions were not being recognized, they were not being given the same, the same rights as the Englishmen. The Polish workers staged the first strike in America, not for higher wages or better working conditions, but for civil rights and inclusion in the political process. Zbigniew Stefanski wrote, in order to give the Englishmen more time to consider what they were doing, we Poles stopped all our work until our complaints would be reviewed in London. The Poles were so angry that they were being cheated of the chance to participate that they organized a work stoppage. You might call it a strike. Not for money, not for better working conditions, but for respect as true citizens of this colony. Poles arrive in the New World with a sense that they have some innate dignity. And this is perhaps a bit of a surprise to the English that these craftsmen who are just engaging in some trades would actually want political rights. The court book of the Virginia Company on July 3, 1619 noted, in the dispute with the Polonians residing in Virginia, we declare that they will have the same voting rights as other settlers in the colony. And in one day, the leaders of the English colony gave in and said, you're right. And they allowed them to become citizens of the colony to vote. These early Poles were not laborers. They were artisans, uh, producing soap ash, potash, glass, other commodities was the work of skilled craftspeople. They were skills that were passed on in a craft system, much as a master would pass his knowledge on to an apprentice. The Poles are granted their rights, uh, but they recognize that the Poles have very valuable skills, and that these skills need to be passed on to the young men of the colony. Their idea of relationships with the natives is to try to sign treaties with them to purchase land. Uh, as the population begins to expand, the, they want more and more land. Eventually the Indians get the impression that they're not going to be satisfied until they have all the land. Hostilities break out.
It happened on the morning of the 22nd of March, 1622. The attack came right before dawn. About 500 Native Americans assaulted Jamestown. They didn't touch the glassworks, but as soon as the battle scream sounded, we immediately ran to the fort. And Jamestown was on fire. Natives were killing everyone, without exceptions, as if they were taking revenge for all those years when they had suffered poverty and the ignominy from whites. And over 300 of the colonists were killed by the Indians. So by that time, the Indians had become very much against and fearful of this uh, constant immigration of these newcomers. English settlers eventually beat the attack off and were successful in sustaining the colony. It's a very important moment, uh, and, it, and it, while it's very distant from our world, uh, if we'd gone back in time and, and lived there, it would have been very difficult, very alien to us, uh, and yet it, it helps to lay the basis for the world we live in today. In the year of our Lord, 1622, my wife Berta became homesick for Harlem. Her desire to go back to the Netherlands became so overwhelming that we boarded the first outgoing ship and left Virginia forever. Zbigniew Stefanski, who after 13 years left Virginia, wrote, Bogdan and Anna remained in Virginia. Also, other Poles did not find any reason to seek livelihood elsewhere. Bogdan already owned a tobacco plantation. Others established profitable enterprises. A desire to become rich got into their blood, and for that reason, they decided to remain. Poles were not just simply coming there for a ride. They were not just coming there to have a good time or try to make a lot of money. They were there to really contribute their skills and their talents, and they really did make a contribution to the survival of this colony. Even in that little nascent hundred people in the English colonies, and within the first year, from 1607 to 1608, uh, you see the arrival not only of just the English colonists, but Poles, uh, Dutchmen, later Germans. Some have argued there were Italians by the 1620s. You see people coming from other nations to Jamestown. Most of them brought specifically by the English for the skills they could contribute to making Jamestown a success. Uh, and, you know, what do we have today? We have 300 and some odd million people from all over the world doing exactly the same thing. Had the colony failed as the first colony failed, that it's quite possible that uh, the settlement of uh, uh, the Western Hemisphere might have been quite different. Pilgrims from Plymouth managed to create a myth about being the pioneers and builders of America. They get all the credits. Even though they landed on Plymouth Rock some 15 years after Captain Smith and his companions had landed in Jamestown. If Jamestown had failed, would they have even come to North America? Yeah, perhaps not. If the English had both the Roanoke failure and the Jamestown failure, would the Pilgrims have ever been given a charter? The Pilgrims were given a charter to settle in Virginia. That was their destination, it wasn't Massachusetts. And they were apparently blown off course or miscalculated and ended up in Massachusetts. Plymouth settlers and the Massachusetts Bay settlers were much better equipped to survive in the New World because they were farmers. If Virginia had failed, perhaps the Pilgrims never would have gotten permission to sail to North America because there wouldn't have been a Virginia for them to go to. Had Jamestown failed, it's possible that the French and the Spanish would have split up North America between the two of them, and the English might never have had colonies in North America. Of course, it also brought many other not such good things. Of course, we have the expansion of slavery and very brutal conditions that uh, the Indians, the native peoples of the Americas had to endure.
uh, to see that Jamestown and the way the early colonists interacted with the Indians and developed their economy had lasting effects up into the uh, 20th and now the 21st century. This was the start of, in a sense, a global economy. This is the beginning of, of the English world economy, the beginning of English dominance of the Atlantic trade. The arrival of, of these Poles indicates how well integrated Poland was into the, to the uh, European and world economic system at the time. Jamestown, ironically, that the Poles help out with, symbolizes the British moving away from that trade with Eastern Europe and, and beginning a more Atlantic-centered trade. It symbolizes a change for Poland as well, uh, but it, it is the beginning of, uh, of really a, a new era in world history. The story of Jamestown has been told by various writers and nowhere do we see any mention by American scholars of the Poles at Jamestown. This was a natural choice for Smith. Uh, it was not something that, oh, it's very strange that I'm bringing in Poles. It was, it was a natural choice. No one seems to have questioned this. So it shows how important Poland was. We see the gradual movement of the Indian frontier back to, first to the Appalachian Mountains and then to the Mississippi River and then out to the Great Plains with a whole series of treaties between the United States and the Indians. Virginia's main product becomes tobacco, uh, and this requires, of course, a great deal of labor, uh, and initially uh, bringing over large numbers of relatively poor Englishmen or Scots or Irish, as the case may be. And then later on, there's the beginning of, of course, the, the very sad case of uh, importing African slaves into Virginia to work in the tobacco plantations. So we have the beginning of slavery there. Not such a happy thing to think about, but part of the history of also of this expansion of this increasingly global international economy. They settled not only in America, but in Canada. Uh, they settled all throughout Western Europe and many times made tremendous contributions. No mention is made any longer about Kazimierz Pulaski, Kazimierz Pulaski, a Polish patriot in Poland who lost everything in Poland, fighting for Poland's freedom, and then who came to America. I expect that the Poles, who have the reputation worldwide of being brave warriors, will be a great help to my poor homeland. In our country, any form of tyranny is met with our disgust. So if anywhere on the globe someone is struggling for freedom, it is as if it were our own struggle. Offered his services to the American independence cause, organized the American cavalry, and gave his life to the United States at the Battle of Savannah. Glorious death awaited him, who loved honor even more than life itself. The Polish nation extended its helping hand overseas to light the flame of freedom. The same is true of Kosciuszko, Tadeusz Kosciuszko, another great hero, an engineer by training, who helped build the fortifications and really was responsible for the fortifications at the West Point in New, on the Hudson River, who contributed his talents on a number of American military victories. An American troop caught the English camp unawares with a nighttime attack near Utah Springs. The surprised Englishmen were not able to defend themselves. They begged for mercy to spare their lives. Kosciuszko forbade the killing of those Englishmen who surrendered under pain of death. In this way, he saved the lives of several dozen English soldiers. This act was rewarded by George Washington, who, as a token of his appreciation and respect, gave him his ring. Person who was respected enough that he was made a brigadier general at the end of the war by George Washington, and who, when he died, left his American estate to the care of Thomas Jefferson for the purpose of buying the freedom of slaves and educating them. The slaves that the English brought in to work the fields in Virginia later become the source 
of differences between the northern and southern colonies under British rule, which leads to all kinds of conflicts. Slavery became the reason for the divergencies between the northern and southern states, leading to conflicts. The result was the Civil War, with over 600,000 killed, the repercussions of which we still feel today. Josef Karger was appointed Brigadier General in recognition of his bravery and valuable service. General Karger was convinced that the cause for which he fought was just, and he thanked God that the hydra of vile slavery had been finally crushed. Vodzimierz Krzyzanowski was a vocal opponent of slavery, and he created the Polish Legion. The American Congress awarded him the rank of general. On the occasion of the repeated burial of the remains of Vlodzimierz Krzyzanowski, the general of the Civil War, in the Arlington graveyard, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt declared, it is high privilege to bear witness to the debt which this country owes to men of Polish blood. In 1976, President Ford appeared at the national meeting of the Polish-American Congress, and there he praised the Poles of Jamestown. The ingeniousness of the Polish immigrants presented fill all Americans of Polish descent with pride. These are the very qualities that made America a great country. The Polish National Alliance was celebrating its 100th anniversary as an organization. President Jimmy Carter was the main speaker. The spirit of the Jamestown Polonians is very much alive here in this room and across the ocean. The events of recent weeks in Poland have inspired the world. At that time, we have the birth of the Solidarity Labor Trade Union, which had just been created uh, in Gdańsk. The world abounds with knowledge accessible to everybody. Acquiring such knowledge as could be useful in one's service for the good of God and country, he could share this knowledge with his countrymen, gaining for Poland greater recognition and still higher respect of the great nations of the world. They contributed. Even American presidents said they contributed. Ford, uh, Eisenhower, and uh, Carter, and no mention by scholars. This kind of erasing of the Polish contribution should not be accepted. Poles struck for equal rights, giving birth to the multi-ethnic American ideology, later so well expressed by the United States, created by the United Peoples of America in 1776, a new nation. We should work together to foster greater knowledge and appreciation of the truth, of the truth not exaggerating, simply the truth. An example had to be set for the entire globe to demonstrate the people of all races, nationalities, and faiths can live in one country together, in peace. To think of what would have happened had Jamestown failed uh, opens up a lot of interesting possibilities, uh, including us sitting here talking in either French or Spanish today. And the bigger story is the need to begin to give more attention to the contributions that Poles have made to the United States and really even to the world.